This is lesson four, part B, voltaic cells. We're going to elaborate on what we talked about in the last video. So in the last video, we had mentioned to you guys that we have a reaction between zinc and copper, which was part of Alessandro Volta's voltaic pile. So using table J, you have to look up the um, zinc and copper, and wherever they fall will determine who is going to be oxidizing or losing electrons and who is going to be reduced or gaining those electrons. So looking at table J, you will see that copper is below zinc, or zinc is higher up on the activity series. So that is why the half reaction for solid zinc is showing that it is losing those electrons because it's higher up on table J. Copper, because it is lower, is not being oxidized, it's being reduced. So you're seeing copper gaining those two ele electrons, making solid neutral copper. Yeah, and you can see that in the little picture too. You see the solid piece of zinc that's shoved into the blue solution. Remember, the blue solution is usually a copper-based solution. And then if you look at the picture, you see that as zinc is oxidizing and losing two electrons and going into the solution, the copper that's already in the solution is getting those electrons and becoming a solid. And through the entire redox process, you'll then see a physical change. You'll notice that the solution is starting to get more clear, meaning that the copper is getting used up, and the zinc rod that was in the solution is now gaining a shell or an oxide coating of our copper. Yeah, and then if we were to take that zinc piece out, it would actually have that copper attached to it. Um, so the zinc actually goes into the solution, clearing up the solution, making it a little bit you know, less blue. The copper is getting out of the solution and attaching itself. Mm -hmm. In a pure elemental form. Right. So the entire half reaction, after we simplify and remove the electrons, is showing that neutral zinc plus copper ions will make zinc ions and pure copper, which we see in both picture A and picture B. Electrical energy is produced in a voltaic cell by spontaneous redox reaction. Remember that word spontaneous means it happens all on its own without any outside source. Um, this can also be called a galvanic cell, but we are naming them after Alessandro Volta because he's the one who originally started the whole idea. And the main so, thing that he wanted us to all know is chemical energy is being converted into electrical energy. Right. The chemical energy means that the actual elements and the ions, because of the transferring of those electrons, that's chemical energy. The electrical energy is just the ability to do work. work, 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 work. So this is a basic picture of what a voltaic cell looks like. If you notice, you have two beakers. One of them has a zinc sulfate solution. One's got a copper sulfate solution. On the left, you're noticing an anode. On the right, you're noticing your cathode. On the very top, you have a voltmeter, which is going to measure the amount of current which is flowing through the wire, which is the line with the little arrows with the electron symbols that connects the anode to the cathode. And in the very middle, we have what's called a salt bridge. And the salt bridge's main purpose is to allow the flow of electrons back into the solution. One thing you have to notice is that zinc anode is in zinc solution. That's because we don't want the zinc to react until we want it to react. So the zinc has to go into a solution that it will not react with anything else. So the safest way is to make it with zinc. Same idea with the copper. So there are a couple different parts of every voltaic cell that you guys need to know. You need to know that the anode is the electrode where oxidation occurs. The cathode is the electrode where reduction occurs. A salt bridge is the chamber where you put gel electrolytes um, and it allows the circuit to continue. And now half cells are where oxidation and reduction happen alone in separate compartments. There's an external circuit which is used to conduct the flow of electrons between the electrodes of the voltaic cell and includes a thing that we call a load. And the load is the part of the circuit which utilizes the flow of electrons to perform some function. In this picture, it's a voltmeter. It tells us how much energy is flowing through. Other times, it could be like a light bulb. Yeah, if you remember from the last video, we used a light bulb. And whenever you overload a circuit, the circuit blows out because you put too much energy into the wires, and whatever that thing is cannot support it because there's too much heat or energy. So let's try this little quiz. Let's start with the first one. A battery consists of what type of cells? 
and that would be electrochemical. Let's try the second question. Which statement best describes how a salt bridge maintains electrical neutrality in the half cells of an electrochemical cell? It permits the migration or the movement of ions. An electrode is a conductor in a circuit that carries electrons to or from a substance other than a metal. The electrode at which oxidation occurs is called the anode, and the electrode at which reduction occurs is called our cathode. So the way I remember it is that I have a red cat and an ox, and I really do. I actually do. Where, where do you keep the ox? In, that's, that's <laughs> in the my desk question. drawer. <laughs> oh, in the drawer? Yeah. That's a very small ox. Yes. He's miniature. So this is one mnemonic that you guys should probably write down in your reference table. Red cat and anox. Another mnemonic that you guys should write down is effort. E-F-F-U-R-T. Um, sure. Yeah, sure. So effort means electrons flow from oxidation to reduction. And if you think about what we just talked about on the previous slide, your anode does oxidation. Your cathode does reduction. So therefore, electrons flow from your anode to your cathode in yeah. a voltaic cell. Yeah. The other way I also think about it is that it goes from A to C, alphabetical order. So how do they actually move? Well, every time you have an atom with that electron cloud, another electron elsewhere flies in and then keeps bouncing and bouncing and bouncing from electron cloud to electron cloud, which yeah. we simply call the flow of electricity. Right. So again, Looking at this picture, we're noticing that instead of a salt bridge, we have a porous barrier. Porous barrier means it has microscopic pores, or little tiny holes, which allow the flow of negative and positive ions between the two half reactions. Let's zoom into the atomic scale and see how this cell operates. Here, at the anode, the site of oxidation, zinc atoms in the metal bar are in contact with the surrounding electrolyte solution. Each atom loses two electrons and becomes a zinc ion, which diffuses into the solution. The electrons given up enter the bar and join the flow of electrons up toward the external circuit. They travel through the wire and flow into the cathode, the site of reduction. When a copper II ion in the cathode solution makes contact with the copper electrode, it gains two electrons and is reduced to a copper atom, which deposits on the bar. Therefore, as the cell runs, the zinc anode becomes lighter and the copper cathode heavier. Now let's close in to see the role of the salt bridge. The non-reactive sodium and nitrate ions of the salt bridge prevent the buildup of charge that would occur as zinc ions enter the anode solution and copper II ions leave the cathode solution. Such a charge buildup would halt cell operation. In the anode compartment, nitrate ions leave the salt bridge to balance the gain of positive charge as zinc ions enter the solution. Some zinc ions also enter the salt bridge. In the cathode compartment, sodium ions leave the salt bridge and nitrate ions enter it to balance the loss of positive charge as copper II ions leave the solution and are reduced at the cathode. So a dry cell is a voltaic cell in which the electrolyte is a paste. So dry cells like Duracell batteries. But if you look at this picture in the bottom, the carbon rod that's in the center, then there's this electrolytic paste, and then there's um, a zinc canister around it. Okay, so that electrolytic paste is going to be our quote-unquote salt bridge. Mm -hmm. And that allows the flow of electrons and currents between the zinc and the carbon. Now, it only allows it if we connect the circuit, though. So that positive end, that anode end, and that cathode end have to get connected as well. Mm -hmm. So. Batteries, for example, are just a group of cells that are connected together. So when we talk about car batteries or lead storage batteries, which are always asked on the regions, you have to understand that inside of a lead storage battery, your car battery, this is the reaction that occurs. Car batteries dominantly have the metal lead that's inside of them, and they're always immersed in a sulfuric acid 
uh, solution, which acts as an electrolyte. Which is why they always tell you if it's damaged to be really careful with it because mm -hmm. sulfuric acid is very dangerous. And did you know if your car battery is dead, you can actually pour like red wine, I heard, into your car battery to help jumpstart it? No. Yeah, because red wine has acid, acid in it. Acid in it, yeah. And that would cause an electrolyte if you run out of sulfuric acid. So I should just carry... Wine in your car as you drive all the time? Yeah. That sounds... Why don't I just carry vinegar? I feel like that's safer. I won't get pulled yeah, over. Yeah, you won't get pulled bed. over for that one. Yeah. So yeah, you should probably carry like a bottle of vinegar in your car. And and all of our students can go and purchase vinegar. That, well. Yep. So when you're like 17 with that mm. beater car, and the battery dies, pour some vinegar in it. So in your oxidation, you're noticing that you are going from lead in a sulfite ion to making lead sulfate, which is insoluble, also releasing two electrons. And in the reduction reaction, you're taking that insoluble compound in the presence of that acid, which is the H ions and the SO4, and you're noticing that you're again now making water with that insoluble stuff. So this is showing your oxidation reduction reaction. But inside of a car battery, you have six different cells. Each cell produces about two volts of electricity, and as you're noticing, six times two is 12 volts, which is the entire voltage of a car. So the more cells you put inside of a battery, the more voltage you can get out of it. So a fuel cell combines hydrogen and oxygen to produce electricity, heat, and water. So fuel cells are often compared to batteries. Uh, they both convert energy um, by a chemical reaction into usable electrical power. But this is what we call clean energy. Because you don't make any waste. You don't make any carbon monoxide or smog or carbon-based bad particles. Yeah, you just make water at the end, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have heard about this new car, it's called a Nissan LEAF. They actually have a fuel cell where they inject uh, hydrogen. They have a hydrogen tank somewhere in the car, and they take oxygen from the atmosphere. When they combine the two in the battery, which is in the picture, you'll notice that there is an anode and there is a cathode, but the two ions, the oxygen and hydrogen ions, will come together making water as a product. So it's kind of weird. You're driving this car around and once in a while you have to like drain the water tank. Yeah, and I'm almost positive that before the solar panels came out on satellite dishes, they used fuel cells as well. Yeah, so you would have a fuel cell in outer space. So if you're inside like the International Space Station, the fuel cells are just constantly taking hydrogen and oxygen, putting them together to make electricity, heat, and water. Yeah, we just have to be really careful with those hydrogen uh, tanks because just like the Hindenburg, there's they're pretty, a damage. Yeah, they're they're going to be very, explosive. very, very reactive. So like a little microscopic dust particle in space slams into your hydrogen tank. Mm -hmm. might, Not even in space, even that Nissan Leaf we have to be careful with. Oh yeah. So I shouldn't bump a Nissan Leaf too hard? No. Mm -hmm.